morning and welcome to this service of worship with the Congregation of St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. My name is Mark Schaefer. I am the senior pastor here at St. Matthew's. It is my privilege to welcome you to this time of worship with our congregation. If you are new and just joining us for the first time via live stream, I invite you to click on the links in the description of the video to find the appropriate worship materials where you can follow along in our worship responses and in our sung hymns. I also invite you, if you are a new or returning member, to share this video as you watch it so that others may see and be invited into our fellowship this morning. Wherever you have come from, whatever you believe or doubt, whomever you love, you are welcome here to join with us in this worship of God. And so I invite you to join in the opening call to worship found printed in your worship materials. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name alone is exalted, whose glory is above earth and heaven. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his suffering. I invite you to join now in singing our opening hymn, Draw Us In, The Spirit's Tether, number 632 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Join me now in the opening prayer found printed in your worship materials. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us granting us this, in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen.
we now come to a time of announcements. And I know, Becky, you have a couple of announcements you'd like to make. Good morning, everyone. Um, online will be the Sunday school registration. And even if you are not planning to do online Sunday school, we are asking that you fill one out. Um, and Sunday school is open to all. You do not have to be a member of St. Matthew's. That is due by September 14th. So please get that filled out so we can start. I'm um, aiming to start on the 20th of September. Also, please complete our youth group registration. Again, you do not have to be a member of St. Matthew's to join our youth group. We welcome all youth from 6th six, to 12th grade. We're going to do a hybrid youth group this year, or in the, at least in the fall, um, where we will meet in the parking lot sometimes, and sometimes we will do Zoom. Uh, please complete the registration so we can start our meetings, and that one also is due September 14th, so that we can start on the 20th. And if you're interested in going on ASP mission trip during the summer of 2021, please email me that you're interested. This is for high schoolers, um, college age, and adults. My email address is beckyroper at stmatthews.bui.org uh, slash bui.org. And I will be registering our group this week, and we need some numbers, so please do that. Um, as of now, we have two youth and two adults. Uh, College Connection Revival. The UMW would like to stay connected with our college age young adults, whether they're on campus or at home. If you could please email me, Becky Roper, St. Matthews, by September 15th with the student's name, birthday, college or technical school, year of study, major and current address, we would like to send them mail. So please do that. And for a reminder, you can see the midweek messenger. So thank you so much. Are there any other announcements that need to be lifted up at this time? I would point out that this is Labor Day weekend. It is a weekend in theory, set aside to celebrate labor. It winds up often being a picnic holiday or a cookout holiday. But as it is Labor Day, I thought it might be good for us to hear the words of the United Methodist Social Principles on labor. The, we, the United Methodist Church claims that all economic systems belong under the judgment of God, no less than other facets of the created order. Therefore, we support the right of all public and private employees and employers to organize for collective bargaining into unions and other groups of their own choosing. Further, we support both the right of both parties to protection in so doing and their responsibility to bargain in good faith for the framework of the public interest. In order that the rights of all members of society be maintained and promoted, we support innovative bargaining procedures that include representatives of the public interest in negotiation and settlement of labor management contracts, including some that may lead to forms of judicial resolution of issues. We reject the use of violence by either party during collective bargaining or any labor management disagreement. We likewise reject the permanent replacement of a worker who engages in a lawful strike. It's worthy of note that our first social creed published in 1908 was driven almost exclusively by concerns of labor and the rights of laborers for dignity, for living wages, and for fair treatment in the marketplace. So we have a long history of supporting the labor movement in the United Methodist Church, and is one of the things we can celebrate this Labor Day weekend. If there are no other announcements, then let us turn to a time of the prayer of confession, joining with me reading in unison. All merciful, tender God, you have given birth to our world, conceiving and bearing all that lives and breathes. We come to you as your daughters and sons, aware of our aggression and anger, our drive to dominate and manipulate others. We ask you to forgive us, and by the gentle touch of your spirit, help us to find a renewed sense of compassion, that we may truly live as your people, in service to all. Amen. Hear the good news, that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That proves God's love for us. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
And as a forgiven and a reconciled people, let us share in signs of Christ's peace with one another by turning to those sitting nearest to us or by typing in greetings in the comments on the Facebook feed. Peace be with you. And now is our time for joys and concerns. Beth Lane is asking for prayers for her daughter, Linda, as she has a very painful nerve in her foot. Um, and a joy, Heather Isinger is, has started her music therapy internship this week. So prayers of thanks for a good learning opportunity. Also, there's concern for Guatemala from Impacto Ministry. An immediate family member to a happy tummies worker was diagnosed with COVID-19, and this has caused the closure of happy tummies for a two-week quarantine. The cases around the lake are on the rise, and lack of local medical resources is a major concern. Impacto Ministry is asking us to join them in prayer, praying for happy tummies workers, children, and their families, and healing for Guatemala and the world. I am saddened to announce the passing of Virginia Shiflett. We are asking for prayers for her husband, Walter, and family. Ms. Virginia passed away August 29th. For more information, please visit the Callas, that's K-A-L-A-S, funeral home page. And a celebration of her life will be held at a later date. We are also asking for prayers for Reverend Glenn. He's having some serious back issues and my understanding is he will be having surgery, so let's keep him in our prayers. Please send prayers for Jean and Tammy Lyles. Tammy's mom, Jean, is very sick, so if we could send prayers to them. Dee Dee and Bill Greaves wanted to thank the congregation for their prayers, calls, cards, and other support following the passing of Dee Dee's father, Clarence Weaver. They look forward to being able to thank people in person after the pandemic is under control. And let's send birthday greetings to Bill and Dee Dee Grief's eldest daughter, Ann Teresa. Happy 21st birthday today. And Bill's mother, Barbara Greaves, celebrated her 80th birthday yesterday. So a very happy birthday to Mrs. Greaves. Just a reminder, if you have a prayer request or joy, we have prayer request cards in the Northrix. After completing one, please bring your own pin and drop it off in the box outside of the office. Or you may email them to Joys and Concerns, and that's one word, at St. Matthews. Or you may call Donna Lane, and her number is in the directory. And now a moment of silence for those names whispered or that are in our hearts. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, your son Jesus has told us that when two or three gather in his name, there you are among us. And as we gather here this morning, we do so to bear one another's burdens, to celebrate one another's joys, and in all things, to abide in your presence with us. We pray this day for all those who are sick, all those in need of healing, all those afflicted in the body and longing for the restoration of the flesh. We remember especially Linda and Pastor Glenn. We remember the many thousands afflicted by COVID-19, especially where that illness has disrupted needed services as it has in Guatemala. We pray for the healing of all those who are sick, all those facing chronic illness, all those facing difficult recoveries. And we ask that they may be attended to by practitioners whose hands are guided with compassion and skill, that they may have access to the resources they need, that they might find loving community to provide support for their healing and recovery. We pray, O oh God, for those who experience illness in ways we cannot see in heart, in mind, or spirit, 
We pray for those who suffer from anxiety and depression, for those who suffer from other mental illness, for those whose anxieties or feelings of isolation have been augmented during this time of pandemic, that they too might find helpful hands to guide them in healing, that they too might have access to the resources they need, that they too might find in us loving and supportive community. We pray for those who experience the brokenness of death. We remember especially the Greaves family. We remember especially the family of Virginia Shiflett. And we pray for all those who mourn, that they may be comforted in their grief, and that they may not mourn as others do who have no hope, but as we do who mourn in the midst of hope. We pray, O oh God, for the healing of the world itself in all the ways that it is broken, broken in our social systems, broken in our economic systems, broken in our political systems, broken in the natural world, broken in so many ways. But we know, O oh God, as we lift up these prayers to you, that you have already heard them and that you are already at work. For we see your purposes already being accomplished in the world, in the celebrations that we have of friends and family, in the gathering that we have even virtually as community, in the hopes for restoration, in new jobs, new internships, in new opportunities, in expressions of love and support, we see you at work. And so it is that we are able to pray these things to you in your holy and blessed name. Amen. I invite you to join in our next hymn, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Jesus in my heart, in my heart. 
This morning's reading from the Hebrew Scriptures is from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month I shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided into proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it one or two drop, two doorposts, and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord. Please join me in the reading of Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. Praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with chains of iron, to execute on them the judgment decree. This is a glory for all his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. Please join us for the gospel acclamation. gospel reading is from the gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, 
let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among you. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning, children. I have a question for you. What does one plus one equal? Did you say two? Right. Today, I'm going to show you a way that one plus one equals three. This morning, I have two colorful paints with me. Hopefully you can see these. There's a bright blue and then a beautiful red. Watch carefully. So when you gather them together and combine them, it makes what color? Can you tell? Purple. purple. Yes, purple. So two colors of paint and a third new color. So that is one plus one equals three when they're combined together. And this reminds me of something that Jesus taught his disciples. Today in Matthew 18, Jesus said that when two or more believers are gathered, that he is there. Now we know that Jesus is always with us, but in some special way, Jesus is with us right now here with us, or he's here at your, he's with you at your home when we come together. We can't see Jesus, but he said he would be right here with us. Now, I'm going to count the number of people in church. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven people. So how many are there really? There are twelve. Because Jesus said that when two or more are gathered, he will be with us. So he's here. Now, I have another important question for you. Have you ever done something to someone that's not so nice? You can whisper your answer if you want to. It's hard to admit, but I bet we can all think of times that we haven't been as kind to people as we should have. And I bet you can also think of times that other people haven't been kind to you. So I have another question for you. What should we do about it? That's a pretty easy question when we're the ones who've been hurt, isn't it? What's the right thing to do when we've been unkind in some way. Well, we can apologize from our hearts and mean it. And then to show we mean it, we need to change our behavior. Because if you keep repeating being unkind and keep saying you're sorry, you really aren't, are you? So we need to remember to change our behavior, right? But what about when others are unkind to us? What's the best way to solve that problem? I wish I could hear your answers. But I bet your mom or dad or your grandparents, the adult you're watching with would love to hear your ideas on how to solve the problem when someone is being unkind to you. In today's gospel, not only does Jesus tell us that he's here with us when we gather, but he teaches us a lesson about problem solving in our own relationship with others. Jesus says that when others have done something 
that has hurt our feelings or maybe our friend's feelings, something that's just unkind and mean, Jesus suggests that the first thing we do is talk with them. And hopefully you, that will fix the problem. But if that doesn't work, maybe we need some help. Sometimes asking your friend or family member for ways to help can really make things better. Or you can talk to me or Pastor Mark. How can you do that now when we're not together? That's right, you can email us, you can call us, you can even ask for a Zoom meeting. Just reach out to me or Pastor Mark and we'll gladly talk to you about what's bothering you. And if none of that works, Sometimes we just need to take a break from the person, and that's okay. Let us keep those good ideas in our mind this week, and let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this wonderful miracle that when we gather, Jesus is right there with us too. Help us to be kind to others, and to be good problem solvers, following in your path when we face problems with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you join with me in a moment of prayer? Now, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I've got something to admit. We've been together about two months. I figure it's okay to admit this to you. This is weird. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a really strange thing to preach a sermon into a camera. I mean, so much of the training that we preachers get in seminary does not equip us for this kind of ministry. See, they teach us not only how to write the sermons, but also how to stand, how to balance making eye contact with the congregation and keeping an eye on your manuscript. They keep, teach us how to be mindful of our spoken and our physical tics and how not to get overly distracted by congregants' facial expressions. That one has come in particularly handy. I used to have a young woman in my congregation who would scowl all the way through the sermon, only to tell me how much she liked it afterwards. When we took our preaching courses, we had to practice in front of our classmates, and we had to give sermons in congregational settings, and then be evaluated by those classmates in that setting on how we preach. So it's just a little bit odd not to have a congregation in front of me to preach to. I mean, speaking into a camera or two 
is a different kind of setup than the one I was trained for. I really can just look in one direction the whole time if I want to. I could have a teleprompter and just read the sermon right into the camera if I wanted. I don't have to worry about nervous habits, like tapping my foot or bouncing my leg. And I could just ask George to frame me in such a way that those things don't even matter. In fact, I could get by without even wearing shoes if I really wanted to. It's a strange thing to be in a church ready to preach and not to have a congregation to preach to. I mean, the stuffed animals are nice, but they don't do it. It's a strange thing also to preach to people who can see me, but I can't see them. It's probably why I appreciate having the handful of folks we have here, if nothing else, to be faces who can react to something. It doesn't even really matter if it's a positive reaction, so long as it's a reaction. As I said, this is weird. And all the more so that we know, because we know, that a church is ultimately not about this place. It's about the people who make it up the people who are now absent from our pews. And we can admire beautiful empty churches, and I have my share of photographs of just those kinds of places. But even the most gorgeous cathedral is lacking. It's lacking in something without anyone in that space to worship. Each of the scripture lessons we had today is actually about the people of faith as congregations. The, the passage from Exodus, Moses and Aaron are commanded to tell the whole congregation of Israel how to prepare for and then how to perpetually commemorate the Passover. This congregation will be described in the text as later leaving Egypt. That congregation journeys by stages through Sinai. That congregation is at the foot of Sinai to receive the law. That congregation is instructed to remain holy as God is holy. It's a term that defines the Israelites, not by their leaders, not by their priests, not by their sacred rites, but by this gathering of the people, the congregation of Israel. In the Gospel lesson, a similar definition is made. The word church, by the way, only appears in Matthew's Gospel. It doesn't appear in the other three Gospels. And the word only shows up in two instances in Matthew's Gospel. At Peter's confession of Jesus, when Jesus says that upon this rock he will build his church. And here, in the passage we heard this morning. And, and the word for church in Greek is ekklesia which comes from a word that means called out or assembled. It's the same word that's used in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, for the Hebrew word kahal, which means that desert assembly of Israel, a, a, a synonym for the congregation of Israel. And so the church, the word church, ecclesia, is meant to evoke this assembly, this congregation, this gathering of the children of Israel in the wilderness. It is that called out gathering of the faithful. In the Matthew passage, we read of Jesus's instructions on how a disciple should respond to a member of that community when that member of the community has sinned or is engaging in repeated sinning. What the proper response should be in this assembly. The first step is to confront the person directly and to work it out between you. If the person accepts the rebuke and you're able to reconcile, then you've regained them. If not, then you go with a couple of folks, two or three others, and attempt the same reconciliation. This way, there are witnesses who can attest to what was said. However, if the member doesn't listen to you, then you go before the whole body, before the whole congregation. It's only then that if the, if the offending individual will not listen to even the entire congregation, that they should be kicked out, they should be shunned or excommunicated from the community. But then, Jesus continues, he notes that whenever this assembly 
Whatever this assembly binds on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever they loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And further, that if any two of them should agree on anything, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now, it's hard, well, I shouldn't say it's hard because we do it all the time, but it ought to be hard to remove these statements from the context in which they show up. Because it's more likely, or most likely, that it's in this authority to bind or loose heaven, interpreted somewhat expansively by our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church, and somewhat comically in the movie Dogma, that this process of excommunication is being spoken of. That is, if you go through this process, and you, and you need to shun a member of the community, God will back up your decision and your requests. Indeed, if you gather in Jesus' name, it is as if Jesus is there among you. And this is made clearer in the Greek text, where the word translated as anything, somewhat liberally, I will add, is the word pragma, which means something more like a deed, a matter, or a case. So it's more likely that it's saying in any case that you happen to deal, not necessarily any thing. In fact, the requirement for two witnesses seems to parallel a passage from Deuteronomy in which there's a requirement for witnesses before any kind of charge can be made against a member of the community. And so all of this means that Jesus isn't saying that whatever you ask for in whatever circumstance will be, you will receive if you agree. He's saying that when it comes to matters such as these, concerning the reformation of a sinning member of the community, these decisions will be ratified by heaven. Of course, over Christian history, we have come to understand that Jesus' statement, wherever two or three are gathered, there I am among them, it has far greater application than simple matters of church law and procedure. And we've come to understand this statement of Christ's presence wherever two or three are gathered in his name, no matter how small the gathering. And this idea also has parallels in the Jewish tradition. In the rabbinic tractates, we read, but two who are sitting and the words of Torah do pass between them. The divine presence is with them. And so, too, in the church have we understood that when we gather in Jesus' name, however few of us, Christ is present in that gathering. I will say that this has become a favorite church joke any time attendance is sparse at a meeting or some other program we've planned. We'll shrug and say, well, where two or three are gathered? Sometimes I will admit this is all the feeling of a cop-out for not having planned better or done better outreach. But it's an important reminder to the church that the church is not defined by how many people are gathered in any given space, by how many people we can jam into this. It's a reminder that Christian discipleship is qualitative, not quantitative. On some level, level, better to have two or three faithful Christians than two billion who claim the name and don't live out the faith. In that case, those two or three would be a much stronger church than that of the faithless billions. And so although this passage was not intended to be a statement of what constitutes the church at a minimum, it can be a comfort to us to know that Christ's presence with us is not limited to the times when we're able to pack the pews or fill the arenas. Two or three gathered in his name is enough. But what about where none are gathered? What about a situation in which a pastor is alone in their living room, standing in front of an open laptop, looking at boxes of faces on Zoom or Google Hangouts, or standing in his church looking out through a camera at people he can't see? How do we understand what it means to be gathered in any meaningful sense when we, as a people, simply cannot gather. On some level, we know it's not the same as being in person. 
if we could be together safely, we would. We know that the church somehow isn't church, really, without the direct face-to-face -face physical contact, the handshakes, the hugs, the meals. And even as we take more and more steps to keep us connected, we know that our inability to gather physically diminishes our perceptions of our experience. We're not really gathered, we think. And if we're not really gathered, is Christ present with us? Now, I could just say, of course, and end the sermon here. I mean, that is the right answer, but it's important to understand why that's the right answer. And the why of it has nothing to do with whether virtual meetings are equivalent to physical meetings. It has nothing to do with whether the bonds of fellowship can be transmitted across high-capacity phone wires or Wi-Fi networks. It has nothing to do with whether we are doing the same thing separately but together, and that counts as gathering. The why of it is so much deeper. And this is where the context of Jesus' statement comes in. And it really matters. Because Jesus is giving instructions to the church on how to deal with someone who has sinned. It's important to understand that Jesus isn't draw, laying down arbitrary rules and procedures. He's not simply establishing a 10-day filing deadline followed by a process of interviewing witnesses and an opportunity to respond and a right of appeal before a panel elected at a bi-monthly meeting. When someone does something wrong, the loving response Jesus identifies is, talk to that person one-on-one. -on -one. There's no need to publicly humiliate or shame, no getting the person in trouble, just one-on-one -on -one loving, relationship. As one commentator notes, love does not permit them to turn a blind eye to such sin, thus abandoning the wrongdoer to the consequences of this misdeed, but nor will it want to embarrass them before others. If that doesn't work, then you bring along two or three more people, not to antagonize, not to pile on, but simply to witness, to ensure they who have reached out lovingly, compassionately, and to witness to the refusal to repent if you're unsuccessful. Then you bring the matter before the whole congregation. You've tried in private. You've tried with others bearing witness. Now you turn to the whole assembly who reaches out to the individual. And only then, if the person does not repent, is removal or shunning permitted. And even then, the goal of such removal is to encourage the person to seek reconciliation, to be readmitted to the community, to turn and repent. We see this idea in the writings of Paul and in other church leaders. But what clearly frames this passage, this entire passage, is an ethic of love. So what does this have to do with our attenuated congregational existence? It means that where love is, where Christian disciples are engaging in an ethic of love, there Christ is. See, we're not in this circumstance because we're lazy, or because live streaming services allows us to watch sports on another television in the same room or because it's easier to go to church in your pajamas. We're not taking these precautions because we're afraid of the coronavirus. We do these things because we love each other. We do these things because we know that many of our congregation are among the vulnerable populations, either by virtue of age or health condition. We know that we want to care for the vulnerable, not cast their interests aside for our aesthetic enjoyment. We know that we don't want to risk the health of those we love in favor of the simple joys of being in a physical space we love. Further, we know that some churches have become super spreaders, causing the virus to spread not just in the confines of their congregation, but beyond those into the surrounding community. We love our neighbors, not just our members, and we seek their welfare and well-being, too. 
We seek to limit the demands on a strained healthcare system, to flatten the curve so as to ensure that the need for respirators and other medical care be kept to those who truly need them and kept on a manageable level and so that resources remain available to those who need them, especially to those who ordinarily lack resource. We do this so that we are not inadvertently contributing to a circumstance that becomes more lethal and one that overburdens the first responders and other medical professionals. Caring for the vulnerable, caring for our neighbors, Caring for the caregivers, ensuring access to vital resources for the needy are powerful demonstrations of love. And because our worship, our fellowship, however attenuated, however technologically connected, is defined by that ethic of love, Christ is here among us. Now these things aren't easy. Discipleship rarely is. It's not easy to confront someone one-on-one -on -one who has done something wrong. It's not easy to respond lovingly and caringly to wrongdoing. It's not easy to remain separated from one another when our hearts long for the simple connections of ordinary community, the handshakes, the hugs, the potlucks. It's certainly not easy to master new technologies or to sit at a screen staring at different faces all day. It's not easy to watch a live streaming service and, and not want to participate in it meaningfully. But love isn't easy. And these things in them, we demonstrate a profound love, a love of one another, a love of neighbor, a love of the least of these. And in that love, we are joined by Christ, whose name is love, and who has promised us that whenever we are gathered in his name, there he is among us.
At a time when we are physically separated from one another, we can't do communion through the ordinary methods. We can't uh, distribute it, and I can't bless it remotely through the internet, but we can commemorate our Lord's Last Supper, which we do together, following the liturgy that is in our worship materials. So I invite you to join in following along in the communion liturgy, and we will be singing the sung, res sung responses found in the faith we sing 2257 and following the Mark Miller set. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning when nothing existed but chaos, you spoke but a word and light was separated from darkness. That same light you brought to your prophets, through the fire of the burning bush you invited Moses to speak to the liberation of his people, leading them forth through the Passover, through the Red Sea on dry ground. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived among us in new human pain and suffering. He is our Passover lamb, and all who accept their sa his sacrifice for their sins have eternal life. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce the time had come when you would deliver your people. He healed the sick fed the hungry, ate with sinners, cast out the demons of the afflicted, and welcomed those whom no one else would welcome. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and slavery to death, and made covenant with us to be our sovereign God. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks, and he gave it to his disciples to drink, saying, Drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. of the children of God, we are bold to pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we, although many, are one, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ, and the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. I invite you, if you have food at your side, it need not be bread or, or the fruit of the vine, it can be anything that, we, that you partake of that now as a way to celebrate at a distance our common commemoration of this, our Lord's Supper. Just a child, only a child, part of a family. Seated at my father's table, giving thanks for all I see. How glad I am just to be called. God, we give you thanks for this mystery in which you have given yourself for us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of the love that we find in Christ. In the name of the Christ who sends us. Amen. 
We conclude our worship by singing together. They'll know we are Christians by our love, number 2223, and the faith we sing. go into a world in need, a world greatly in need of love. And we go to embody that love, that love that formed us, that love that calls us, that love that sustains us, and that love that when we act in it, guarantees the presence of Christ in our midst. And so as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with us now and always. Amen. Amen.